This is an interview with Reverend Joseph E. Laurie for the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute's Oral History Project. I'm Dr. Horace Huntley. Today is April 11th, the year 2000. Dr. Laurie, we want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule and welcome to the Institute. Well, thank you for inviting me uh, to this marvelous Institute. I'm, I'm, I'm back, glad to be here. Yes, sir. Dr. Laurie, are you native Alabamian? Well, yes, but I'm an authentic northerner. Although you folks here in Birmingham consider yourselves North Alabama, yes, I'm from the real North Alabama, Huntsville. Okay. So I was born in Huntsville, Alabama, yeah. Madison County. Right, because most of us now, we actually migrated from the South, down to Black Belt counties. Uh, so there is some some real significance to your being from North Alabama, I think. Um, let me just talk about your family for a minute. Tell me about your mother and father. What kind of education did they have? Well, my father uh, went to a little training school in Huntsville with uh, uh, Professor McKinley, who was a noted figure uh, 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 in the 19th century. Uh, annals of Huntsville, mm -hmm. and uh, he probably did not finish what we consider now high school. Mm -hmm. My mother went to a normal, mm -hmm. which is now Alabama A and M. Right. So, and she taught school, uh, but she probably had about the equivalent of a, a junior college, I think, mm -hmm. education. But she was both of them were very intelligent, mm -hmm. very very informed, and and inspired me. Uh, considerably, right. uh, they were active church people. Uh, my mother was sang in the choir for about 150 years, <laughs> and uh, and uh, my father was the reluctant churchman. Mm -hmm. In that, uh, my mother spent so much time in church, uh, my father decided he needed to go just to see what was going on. Mm -hmm. He became the treasurer of the church. Okay. And it's very interesting, the church where I grew up in Huntsville, Lakeside, uh, my father's uh, grandfather, uh, Reverend Green Eccles, was the first African-American pastor of my church uh, there in Huntsville. Mm -hmm. The church was founded by the old M.E. Church North and right. had a white pastor, okay. uh, and, but uh, and then after a few years, my great grandfather came in and became the first black pastor of that church. So that would have been late 19th century. That that's right. Mm -hmm. that's, no, that would have been yes, yes, okay. yes, 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 okay. yes, yes, yes. That's correct. Somewhere between emancipation and the turn that's, of the century. That's right, the turn of the century. Okay. That's correct. Right. How many siblings did you have? Well, I had, uh, my parents lost two children mm -hmm. before I was born. Uh, my father was named Leroy, and this boy was named Leroy, and then a girl was born, Alva Lee, mm -hmm. and she passed away as well. Mm -hmm. So I was the first surviving mm -hmm. child, and then I had a sister born three years later, so there were the two of us uh, there in Huntsville. What kind of work did your father do? My father was a, it's a very interesting story. Uh, he worked uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the office of a physician, old Dr. Scruggs uh, in Huntsville. The earliest recollection I have of any physician was, mm -hmm. was Dr. Scruggs. My father, he was still alive when I was old enough to remember. My father worked for him as a single man. Mm -hmm. And the deal was he was to go to Nashville and somehow enroll in pharmacy school and come back and be the pharmacist. And Dr. Scrugg was to write the prescriptions and they would have a partnership. Mm -hmm. So my father didn't have the money. And so he borrowed, he and a friend borrowed some money and some equipment, opened a little ice cream parlor with a couple of pool tables in it. Mm -hmm. And he decided to work for a year or two uh, and then go on to pharmacy school. Uh, it took him the two years to pay for the equipment, right. and so he had to stay another two uh, to earn the money to go to school. He ended up staying 60 years, <laughs> <laughs> running a little business in Huntsville, right. and never did, never did go to, uh, to, to pharmacy school, school but, yeah. but was a very, in the context of what Huntsville is about, mm -hmm. a very successful right. entrepreneur. He uh, 
bought some property and and uh, opened another business, a sweet shop, mm -hmm. and then he opened another billiard parlor, and uh, he became interested in insurance and was elected to the board of directors of Supreme Liberty Life Insurance Company, very, mm. very prominent uh, insurance company among right. in the African American community based in Chicago. Yeah. So he was, uh, he was an enterprising uh, man. Very, it sounded like a very respected individual. Very respected in the community, and probably had more influence on my outlook on life, my ideals, my, mm -hmm. my principles in terms of my behavior, my integrity, mm -hmm. probably more influence than any other individual mm -hmm. in my life. Uh, my mother did or two, but I, I just have to, and that was to be expected. I guess that was so expected till it just mm -hmm. ran That's over, nice. you know, you couldn't see the trees for the forest, sure. uh, uh, forest for the trees because my mother expected, but you didn't always have the fathers who, mm -hmm. who set that kind of example. And I remember I used to write on the board up in the front of the sweet shop, uh, little sayings every week. Mm -hmm. And he would sit down and discuss them with me. Mm -hmm. And the first one I remember was an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know who said it, but yes. my dad is was I'm concerned. He said it. He right. said it. <laughs> and uh, so they had, he had a tremendous influence on my life. He was a man of great honor, mm -hmm. great integrity, yeah. uh, great uh, industry. He was a hard working man and mm -hmm. and uh, there's no such thing as a self made man, but mm -hmm. I guess my daddy came as close to to, to being independent mm -hmm. in terms of his upward mobility right. uh, as you could be. Of course he had help, but sure. uh, he was uh, uh, pretty much alone as far as family was concerned. His, mm -hmm. his mother, uh, I remember her very well, but his father he did not remember too well, mm -hmm. was a part Cherokee who sort of came through on the Via mm -hmm. Dolorosa right. and uh, didn't remember him too well. But my mother, my, his mother, Mom Polly, also had a great influence on my life. Mm -hmm. She was a domestic, but a woman of great dignity, great beauty, and great charm, mm -hmm. and raised two boys practically by herself mm -hmm. and did a marvelous job. So she and my father, uh, that strain had a great deal to do with the molding and, and shaping of my life. Okay. What was it like growing up in Huntsville? Young black man, you know, Birmingham, we look at Birmingham as being the, uh, the most segregated big city in the country. Huntsville is less than 100 miles north of here. How is that different? Well, let me tell you, Huntsville was uh, uh, not an industrial center like Birmingham. Huntsville was a cotton mm -hmm. center. It was an Madison County was agricultural, and, mm -hmm. and Huntsville was full of cotton gins and mm -hmm. cotton uh, brokers who Uh, strangely enough, I had I lived in the city, such as it was, <laughs> uh, about two blocks from the railroad station. Mm -hmm. My grandmother, Mom Polly, my daddy's mother, lived about a block from the railroad station. And whenever I got uh, angry at my parents and was going to leave home, I'd always go by Mom Polly's and stay there. Well, if I were real angry, I'd go on to the railroad track, decide to catch a train, mm -hmm. which I never caught. <laughs> but uh, it was a textile town. We did not have the uh, the 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 uh, terrible, awful kind of oppression in Huntsville. Maybe the uh, the fact that we were not such a major a, a mm -hmm. large minority in the city didn't pose a threat right. that uh, Black Belt communities and even Birmingham did in later years. Mm -hmm. But uh, we knew we were black, we knew we were colored. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember at a very early age, uh, my father bought a new Studebaker. And uh, we were in the car, he and my mother in the front seat and my, I was in the back seat. I guess my sister was there, I don't remember. But uh, uh, that sounds like a boy, doesn't it? <laughs> but, uh, the police stopped my dad. I don't know whether he didn't fully stop for the stop sign or what. And uh, and it was a brand new car. I guess he didn't expect colored people to have brand new cars. And he said, whose car is this boy? And my dad said, this is Mr. Lee Lowry's car. It's Mr. Lee Lowry's car. 
Oh, he said, oh, oh okay, well, you drive it carefully here and, and rove on. Uh, I think he may have thought my mother was white, I'm not sure, mm -hmm. and that daddy was uh, the driver. Mm -hmm. But he let him go on, and that puzzled me. And uh, I was very, very young, and, and uh, I remember asking dad about it, and he gave me uh, the best kind of explanation a very young boy could take, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then one other time I remember, my dad and my mother and I, and I again don't remember whether my sister was present, mm -hmm. uh, don't, don't show her this film. <laughs> uh, the, he, was, he had a flat tire, right. and he was changing the flat tire, and he looked around and saw about four big old hobnail boots around, looked up and there were four of the biggest rednecks he'd ever seen, and uh, they used bad language. What the so-and-so-and-so so, and so, and so you doing, boy? And he said, shh. She said, oh, miss in the car. Oh, miss don't like no cussing. He said, oh, excuse me. Took his hat off and saw my mother. I said, get out of the way, boy. And they changed the tire for him, and, and I'm sitting there in the car, my mother and I trembling, and he's out there trying to keep from laughing his crazy head off. And finally, when they finished, they get the car. And, Good day, miss. We glad to change tire for you. My mother just bowed her head. And we drove off. And we all just, <laughs> as soon as we got down the road, we had to pull the car over because we were, we, were, we were having a uh, What was uh, his complexion? Was my father was a little darker than I. He was mm -hmm. darker than I. Mm -hmm. But my mother was very fair. Right. And uh, uh, you, you, she could... She could have, if she wanted to, she could pass. She could pass right. Because her side, her family, the Fackler's, mm -hmm. were all fair. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a lot of uh, integration mm -hmm. in those days. And I think on my mother's side, uh, her mother uh, participated in integrated situations, as many black colored women had to do in those mm -hmm. days. Miscegenation. Exactly. Yes. Uh, invasion, mm -hmm. rape. Right. <laughs> and, uh, uh, my, my daddy, I recall, from time to time, I didn't exactly understand, used to tease her a little bit about it from time to time, mm -hmm. which he didn't take too well, mm -hmm. and so he didn't tease too often. <laughs> but uh, and, uh, it, that, that were, uh, when a little later, uh, when I was, I guess, approaching teenage level, uh, I was coming out of my dad's sweet shop one day. I was three-fourths out the door and a big red cop was one fourth in the door. He felt that gave him rights, mm -hmm. and he punched me in the stomach with his nightstick and said, get back, nigga. Don't you see a white man coming in the door? And of course, I got back, mm -hmm. and he came in, and uh, he didn't know who I was. I didn't know who he was, and I cried and tried to bite my lips to keep him crying. He didn't want him to see me cry. from the sweet shop, mm -hmm. I remember seeing a little pearl handle pistol that my father had in the drawer, and I went to get it. I couldn't look, couldn't find it. And uh, my mother kept asking me what's wrong, what's wrong, I wouldn't say. And finally I found it. And I started out the front door. What I was going to do, I'm not sure mm -hmm. to this day, but that was my recourse. Mm -hmm. And strangely enough, as I started down the steps, my father was coming up the steps. Now, what's so strange about that is that I guess most of my life as I grew up in Huntsville, I never saw my dad at home in the daytime, except on Sunday. Mm -hmm. uh, just didn't happen, he was working. He right. left home before dog, he ran his business, his help was hard to find, he had to be janitor, mm -hmm. cashier, everything. And, but for some reason, he came home this afternoon, mm -hmm. and probably between three and four, because I was out of school. Mm -hmm. And he saw something was wrong and asked me what was wrong and saw my hand in my pocket, took the gun away from me, and gave me a good sound spanking. Mm -hmm. And I, I could ought to be truthful, a good sound beating. <laughs> my father was not a part of the nonviolent child, school. Child abuse. No, no, no. If, 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 if they had child abuse laws, you know, they, my mother would have been in jail most of the time, and my father occasionally. Mm -hmm. But he, and I told him what happened. He went to the police chief and the mayor to complain, and they told him that uh, they were sorry it happened, but 
that was the only kind of white man they could hire to be police, and there was nothing they could do about it. Mm. They were sorry. My daddy didn't like it and came home and told me, forget it. Mm -hmm. Chalk it up to experience. It'll make you a better man. This is the way the South is, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And about my father, this insurance company I mentioned, one year he drove, let me ride with him to Chicago to the board of meeting of the Spring Liberty Life. Mm -hmm. And oh, it was a thrill for me because I'd never been out of Huntsville anywhere except the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, when we got up there, uh, my father got his revenge. We were down in the loop, and we were in heavy traffic and with another friend of ours whose mother lived next door to us. He was a physician, and we were all in the car, and a cop, a cop yelled at Dr. Tate to come on. What are you holding traffic? Come on. And he cursed, GD, come on. And Dr. Tate said, don't cuss me, damn you. And my daddy was shocked to hear a colored man mm -hmm. talk to a white <laughs> police, police officer, officer. Mm -hmm. and so he said, yeah, don't yell at us like that. He got his little, <laughs> he got, I'll never forget. And so I said, yeah, too, in the back seat. So we got our revenge no, on the incident at right. the sweet shop. But let me tell you this, many, many years later, I was pastoring my first church here in Birmingham, mm -hmm. out in East Thomas, St. James. And I went home one, one day and was uh, on the porch talking to my mother and my father and the postman came by and he gave the mail to my mother and I looked at him, he looked at me and thoughts started running through my mind, what is it, what is it, when he left I said, mother, she said yes, I said, who is that man, she said, well, I was hoping you wouldn't recognize him. So that's Mr. Shields. That's the police officer who punched you in the stomach many years ago. And I went down the steps. I wanted to go catch him. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mother wasn't sure what my mm -hmm. purpose was. I didn't. I intended just to, to talk with him. Mm -hmm. And he was coming back. And he said, "Miss Dora, we call her Miss Dora. Mm -hmm. Is this Joe?" And uh, she said, yes. And my father, by that time, he got up and came to the edge of the porch to see what happened. Mm -hmm. And he said, can I shake your hand? I said, yeah, we shook hands. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm passing a little church out in the west side of Huntsville. And I understand you're passing a church in Birmingham. He said, I said, yes, I am. He said, well, I want to tell you I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. He said, I've thought about it many times. Your mother and I have talked Many times I never dreamed I'd run up on you. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I, I understand mm -hmm. how you grew up, how we all grew up, mm -hmm. and thank God we're growing out of. And he said, yes, I'm out of it. I've been born again, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm sorry, and I thank God. And he cried. That's all right. And of course he made me yeah, that's shed a, a that's tear a too. That's a moving story. Very moving story. And, but that was Huntsville. It was, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I only remember one time any talk about the KKK. Uh, they had some kind of little march up Church Street. Church Street, where we lived, came from the depot and went right into the heart of town. So they came by. And I remember uh, my mother, my father wasn't there. Uh, he came, he couldn't get there when he heard it was coming. He couldn't, they were between him and the place of business. Mm -hmm. But my mother closed all the curtains and made us come back in the bedroom and not go to the front. Mm -hmm. Cut the lights out. Uh, I slipped out crawled up the hallway and peeped out the dining room window. I saw them, mm -hmm. and there were only about 15 or 20 of them. Mm -hmm. uh, some didn't even have hoods on. They all had on sheets. Right. And it was a frightening experience mm -hmm. for me mm -hmm. uh, as a boy. Oh, yes. I can imagine. I've experienced that myself. That was Huntsville. Mm -hmm. it, it was a good mixture. The Alabama a &M was there. Mm -hmm. what, about, what about your high school days? High school were very much segregated. Mm -hmm. uh, when busing was an issue in the country, I always wondered why, because I used to see white kids mm -hmm. on buses all the time. Right. So it wasn't the bus, it was us mm -hmm. that they were concerned about. And mm -hmm. I used to walk all the way from down on Church Street down into the Grove, mm -hmm. <laughs> we called the Grove, to the, to the black school, the colored school. Right, pass another school. Pass one other school. Mm -hmm. But white kids, 
passed us in buses going to the, mm -hmm. to the white school, mm -hmm. and we had to go through a white neighborhood mm -hmm. to get to our school. And uh, there were some white kids uh, whose names I won't mention because there may be some family people still there, but about once or twice a week, my friends and I would have a confrontation uh, with these white kids. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm had not been introduced to nonviolence mm -hmm. at that time. Right. And uh, I never saw them after we grew up, but uh, they were infamous, mm -hmm. those kids. And mm -hmm. we used to throw rocks sometimes, uh, throw fists at other times, mm -hmm. uh, go another way when we didn't feel like having a confrontation. Right. But uh, Huntsville was a southern, a southern textile town. mill town. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there were certain parts of town we, did, we never a, went in. And I never saw too many white kids down in the Grove. Mm. Now they could come my street, because my street was just right off downtown and, right. and pretty much uh, yes. non-identifiable yeah. as uh, in those terms. But didn't see too many white kids in the Grove okay. and didn't see too many black, black kids, kids out near the mill. Mm -hmm. What did you do after high school? I went to college at Knoxville mm -hmm. College and uh, in the summer took some classes at Alabama A&M. Uh, there, I uh, got involved with the NAACP uh, as a youth and uh, uh, tasted protests. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, although I, I and, it, and it brought back memories because I remember that uh, my dad carried me to a couple of church meetings, old town hall meetings where they were discussing race relations and some incident. Mm -hmm. And they had a fellow in town named Monk. And Monk was a bad fella. But Monk, every now and then, would beat up a white fella. And uh, <laughs> Monk would attend the meetings. And my dad, I remember my daddy saying once in conversation with a, another doctor that, you know, Monk was a bad nigga. He said, but you know, you, all, you need, every town needs at least one yeah. bad nigga. See, that white folk thought he was crazy. Yeah. And when they think you're crazy, you can get away with a lot of, if you think you're intelligent, mm -hmm. they don't like uppity right. Negro. But one that's crazy, he gets away with a lot. So I, I had tasted the race situation from all those perspectives mm -hmm. I mentioned. And when I got exposed to the uh, uh, youth work of NACP, it, it tasted good to me. It had, mm -hmm. a, had a familiar taste. Oh, yes. I went to college and, and I started teaching school for a while, but and my daddy wanted me to go to law school. Mm -hmm. You came back home. I came after. back home in the summer, but, but in the meantime, before I went to college and finished high school, my dad sent me to Chicago. He had some friends in Chicago, and I spent five years uh, in Chicago uh, going to elementary and two years of high school in Chicago at St. Elizabeth Roman Catholic School okay. and at DuSable High School. I treasure those years because they were very good schools yeah. and taught me the discipline mm -hmm. of study. Who did you have in Chicago? That you A very good friend of my father's. Mm -hmm. I didn't learn until later that uh, it was the brother of an old girlfriend of mm -hmm. my father's mm -hmm. uh, whom he almost married, but she passed. Mm -hmm. And he married my mother, but he and the brother maintain good relationship. And when dad felt that the schools in Huntsville weren't doing what they ought to do, he sent me up there for five, I'd come home during the summer, mm -hmm. but I'd go to Chicago mm -hmm. uh, and during the school years. Yeah, that must have been an experience coming Very from Huntsville to, to Chicago. Very interesting, and, and I guess it's good I went to the St. Elizabeth School rather than the public school at first, because St. Elizabeth was so strict in terms of discipline. Mm -hmm. Till uh, I didn't have much choice to, to be flexible or irresponsible with the rules. Mm -hmm. they, didn't, they didn't tolerate it. So I made the transition without uh, too much right. pain and difficulty. After you came back home, did you ever have a desire to, to go back to Chicago, to live in Chicago? Maybe? Yes, uh, in a way I did, uh, and in a way I didn't. The South. And I lived in, I lived in, uh, I went back to Chicago for a while, mm -hmm. uh, studying for a couple of summers at uh, Garrett out in Evanston, uh, but, and, and lived in Detroit for a while, and studied a little bit there at Wayne uh, just this past winter. 
uh, Wayne University gave me uh, uh, an award named after the great labor leader mm -hmm. uh, with the auto workers, Ruth? uh, Walter Ruther. Mm -hmm. And uh, they got, I was the first recipient oh, okay. of that award, and it did me good because I had walked on the campus at Wayne, mm -hmm. and they gave me that award along with UAW. But I, I, I always prefer the South. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, I guess because I grew up there, and the, the, the neighborhoods, the neighborliness, yes. the yes. the intimacy, the the uh, uh, slower way of life. I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And I came back to, after I went to, uh, uh, in fact, I came here to Theological Seminary in addition to Garrett mm -hmm. for a while, then I went to Garrett. But my first church was here in Birmingham. Mm -hmm. When did you get your first, when did you get first involved with the church in the ministry? I mean, with the church, I, my back, you leave my backyard and walk across the field and go to the church, my mm -hmm. church. Okay. So I grew up. Grew up right in the then. church okay. as much as I did in the home. Okay. Uh, my mother was a Sunday school teacher. She was a choir singer. She ran what they call the harvest program. Every fall, they would have a harvest program. Mother was always in charge. Mm -hmm. And one of the things she did was have all the children bring in these sheaves. Uh, a little, I, I don't know what they are, but they, we call them sheep. Bring it in the sheaves, mm -hmm. and we'd wave them and wave them, and I always did that so long I could sing it in my sleep. <laughs> and I, in any occasion in the church, I say the speech, mm -hmm. and uh, 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 tell everybody told me you're going to be a preacher. Oh, yeah. And I would say, no, I am not. When I get big enough where I don't have to come to church, the church is not going to see me. <laughs> but uh, but I grew up in the church, so. Mm -hmm. And, and I had a couple of ministers, one in particular who was in Huntsville, Reverend Fields, who used to tease me about being a preacher. But then he would take the time to talk to me about the ministry and planted the seed that later on when I was getting out of college, it hit me again. Mm -hmm. And all the seeds that he planted uh, began to, to mm -hmm. bear fruit. And I met another preacher when I went to A&M a couple of summers named Sam Williams, who was teaching economics. And he was a preacher. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, I think that did it. He, he was the radical, mm -hmm. although the other preachers were not radical. The chaplain at Knoxville, Ben Evans, was between radical and conservative. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think I'd had enough that, and my dad, when I started to say, my dad, when I told him, I'm not going to law school. Mm -hmm. You want me to go to law, major in business law? And I said, I'm not going to law school, I'm going to seminary. And he said, why? I think the Lord wants me to preach. I said, uh, you must have some understanding. Your grandfather was a preacher. And all my, my in-laws on my mother's side, several uncles who were preachers on her side of the family. And he said, well, I was so counting on you going to law school, he said, we own a lot down the street on the corner of Monroe and Arm, I mean church and uh, Arm Street. He said, let's build a church there. And you preach all you want, still go on to law school. I said, Dad, I don't think that's, that's, uh, that's what the Lord had in mind. But, and I was very hurt that he was not enthusiastic. Mm -hmm. So I preached my first sermon uh, at my home church. And when people in town heard I, I, I don't want to say this, but when the word got out, I was preaching my trial sermon. You couldn't get into church. <laughs> <laughs> How old were you? I was. Oh, I was. I had come uh, uh, through college. Okay. But they didn't believe. Didn't believe that. That, that this Joe Lowry <laughs> is going to see that for themselves. Had to come see for himself. And right on the front row uh, were several young ladies that I had known growing up, and I wish they would move in the back of the church. <laughs> but I made it through and had a good time, and my father came to me afterwards. And he said, maybe the Lord did touch you. Mm -hmm. And then that Christmas, I came back home. Uh, the Presbyterian church was next door to me. The pastor there asked me to preach the Christmas, early Christmas morning sermon. And I was thrilled. And that did it for my daddy. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm glad. And he said, I just wish my mother, Mom Polly, had lived long enough to see you go into the ministry. But mm -hmm. 
I guess all of that background, when I went into the ministry, uh, I went in, I didn't have to develop a holistic theology. It was sort of ingrained that the gospel had to do with the whole person mm. and the whole of life. Mm. And I always felt that it was trying to make heaven your home, but it was always trying to make your home here heavenly. Mm. Mm. And that was the ministry that led me into the movement. That mm. was the theology, that was the concept right. of ministry that led me to, to civil rights. Yeah. When did that happen? That happened right at East Thomas. <laughs> okay. My first year at East Thomas. Uh, but I wasn't there but a year. But I got involved uh, in activities that were pro Protestant. This is in the mid 40s? Or this the was in 1948. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, then the next year I went to Alexander City. And I stayed there three years. Mm -hmm. now, Alexander City was a that was, I went there in 49, that was, the movement was beginning to, to mm -hmm. pick up then. Mm -hmm. Were you uh, married at the time? Oh yes, I was married, and we had our first child, he's Thomas, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, then we went on from the Alexander City to Mobile, mm -hmm. and it was in Mobile, where they went the month, I went to Mobile in 52, mm -hmm. and the NACP was meeting at my church, and continued to meet, and then the NACP was outlawed, Right. And we organized other protest groups, and I was elected president mm -hmm. of what we call the Alabama Civic Affairs Association. Yeah, okay. And we led the movement in, in Mobile. And uh, it was in Mobile that uh, uh, when the boycott started in Montgomery, uh, and Martin and Ralph issued their first uh, demand. And they had been they had been sitting at the back of the bus and filling up to the front. Mm -hmm. If white people got on, then blacks had to get up and move back. We had been filling it back and if we filled up, we didn't have to get up. Mm -hmm. White folk would start at the front. If they filled up, they didn't have to get up. Mm -hmm. So if white filled it up, they they, they sat, That's we that. rode. If we filled up, we sat, they rode. Mm -hmm. And so when Martin and them made the first demand, I had met him, I knew him already. Mm -hmm. I met him in Boston, I met him again in Montgomery. I called him up, I said, hey, man, y'all asking for what we already got, don't ask. Mm -hmm. For that ask for the whole uh, bag of beans, you know, no segregation. He said, listen, don't worry. <laughs> they are not going to give us that. Mm -hmm. And so we chose to ask for the least. Mm -hmm. uh, so that when they refused that, it'll give us a psychological and spiritual advantage. Mm -hmm. And of course they did, they denied that. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't do that and the boycott mm -hmm. followed. Why the difference in Mobile and Montgomery? I think two reasons. Mobile was in the middle of Alabama. Mm -hmm. I mean Montgomery was in the middle of Alabama. Mobile was on the coast. Mm -hmm. So the Mobile had the cosmopolitan, mm -hmm. uh, you know, flavor right. uh, of, of, of the shipping and the water and, mm -hmm. and different uh, cultures coming in. Plus, Mobile had a city commissioner named Joe Langan very early on, and he was a very sensitive and fair-minded man. And he had a great deal of influence. Mm -hmm. uh, and so Mobile just wasn't uh, as violent at least at first. Mm -hmm. So when we decided to desegregate the buses, I was president of the Ministerial Alliance. And uh, we divided, we had some workshops on nonviolence, and we divided the uh, preachers up. And uh, two by two, we were gonna ride the different bus lines and sit in the front. And I had called, talk with Martin. I had carried, as president, the first thousand dollars up to the MIA mm -hmm. while they were protesting. I, I remember uh, sitting in the church waiting on Martin and Ralph to get there from across town. I had come all the way from Mobile. <laughs> they were Baptists. I was Baptist. That was Presbyterian. <laughs> but they came, and I gave them money, and I told them what we were going to do. So the fellows decided, since I was the quote quote leader that I had to ride the Pritchard line, mm. which was number five. That's been a long time, but I remember. Mm -hmm. That was going out in the heart of Crackerland. Mm. And uh, so Reverend S.M. McCree 
pastor of Mount Zion Baptist Church. Uh, I met his son not long ago, uh, someplace I was, was speaking, his son was there. But anyway, uh, he and I rode the, the bus, Pritchard bus, sat on the front seat. It was facing the front, not on the side mm -hmm. seat, but on the first uh, cross parallel seats. And did all right, got about halfway out there, and a, a white fella got on with a bag. Obviously had a bottle in the bag. Mm -hmm. And uh, McCree said, well, here it comes. And the bus driver hadn't said anything. They had been instructed mm -hmm. not to bother us. Now, th is this during the Montgomery bus boycott? This was just the early stages Girl. of okay. the Montgomery bus boycott. We started, before the bus got it in, boycott had ended, we started our desegregation process. Okay. And uh, 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 when the guy sat down, he, he was a little inebriated. And he didn't realize that these two black guys were sitting on the front seat. And finally it dawned on him <laughs> that the two guys, so he leaned, he was sitting on the side seat right behind the driver. And he leaned over and told the driver, said, hey, make them get back. And the bus driver said, you just ride, I'll drive, I'm in charge of the bus. So the guy said, well, by God, if you don't make them get back, I will. So Reverend McCree, I felt his hand slip in his pocket. I said, don't do that, Reverend. Remember our workshop now. <laughs> and so the fellow started back and I stood up. I said, sir, we're not bothering you. Don't bother us. Sit down, please, and reach your destination, and we'll reach our destination in peace. Thank you, sir. And he sat down. And that, that was what we had learned in our workshop, take the initiative, you know. Mm -hmm. And that was our first time trying it out. You disarmed him. I disarmed him, took the advantage, took the initiative, mm -hmm. and took charge. And I said to McCree, I said, it works, man, it works. <laughs> and I don't know, I won't tell you what he said. He said, but I'll be so and so, it did work. <laughs> and uh, but I learned later, McCree had a little old, little bitty pocket knife <laughs> in his pocket. I said, what were you gonna do with that anyway? <laughs> but that was, uh, that was, we did, and, that was the end of segregation on the buses hmm. in Mobile. Mm -hmm. About a month later, we demanded that they hire black drivers. Hmm. And they did? They did. We gave them six months. They hired them in 90 days. Hmm. So they beat us to the punch. So you yeah. never, Mobile never so, made the headlines right. because we made too much progress. Yeah. That was the news. Mm -hmm. It was the violence, the bummings, and so forth. Right. And um, Montgomery and Birmingham yeah. that made the news. But Mobile moved. Uh, quietly along, and and we even desegregated the lunch counters later, without too much difficulty. How did the outlawing of the NAACP affect Mobile? That, that's when I was elected president of the Civic Affairs Association. Okay. We organized independent organizations. organizations. Yes, yeah. we, when we were in more in here it was called Alabama Christian Movement, right. MIA. Uh, in Montgomery and Civic Affairs Association in Mobile. Mm -hmm. And that was how we, uh, we ran the movement. Uh, right. Later, uh, uh, we uh, were sued by um, the city commissioners and the governor of Alabama, city commissioner of Montgomery and the governor of Alabama for libel, Fred Shuttlesworth, Ralph Abernathy, Joseph Lowry, and Solomon Say in mm -hmm. Montgomery. We were sued for libel. Mm. People in New York who are raising money for the movement put a big ad in the paper. Heed their rising voices. And they called, they said the police ring the campus and brutalize and so forth. And the city commissioners took an exception. And the governor of Patterson ensued. Mm -hmm. And of course, they won the case in That's Montgomery. When they, is that when they took your car? That's the only thing they could find I own <laughs> uh, in Mobile. Uh -huh. Thank God they didn't. Look, in Huntsville, I had a little property that my father had left in Huntsville, but they didn't, uh, they didn't uh, they think didn't, about it. They didn't do that no, homework. No, they did not. And uh, so what they found after they got the, the judgment, $3 million worth of judgment, uh, was found my car in my name, and they took that. Mm -hmm. They took Ralph's car, took Fred's car, took Solomon Say's car. Mm -hmm. Then they also found Ralph's home property in Marengo County, they found that and they took that mm. uh, as well. But but they got new cars. Uh, their churches, Baptist churches, mm. uh, raised money and bought them new cars. So when the 
The old car was sold at auction, they didn't worry about it. Mm -hmm. My folks, good Methodists that they were, went down to the auction <laughs> and bought my old car. <laughs> they outbid everybody, bought my old car for 800 and some dollars mm -hmm. and uh, brought it back and gave it to my wife for a dollar mm -hmm. and put it in her name mm -hmm. so they couldn't get it. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they came to get my car, uh, my house was, the YMCA was, uh, campus was back of the Y, but in the front of my house, across the street, there's a lot of kids out there, and they threw rocks at the sheriff when he came to haul my car away. Mm, is that right? That's a, that libel suit, incidentally, is, uh, is the classic uh, uh, case on libel. Right. It sets the standard. Later, we were uh, vindicated by the Supreme Court, and they had to give the money back. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, is that, was that the Sullivan? That's the Sullivan versus uh, yeah. New York Times right. and Abernathy, Lowry, Shuttleworth, and Say. Yeah. That's okay. the case. Okay. Anthony Lewis, a columnist, just wrote a book, Make No Law, mm -hmm. built okay. around that case oh, okay. and the First Amendment. Okay, yeah. But what the ruling was, and the ruling was by Judge Black from mm -hmm. Alabama. He wrote the majority opinion mm -hmm. that uh, you can't libel a public figure mm -hmm. unless you are malicious. Mm -hmm. They have to prove malice, okay. and of course they couldn't prove, you can't prove malice in most cases. Right. So a public official is fair game. Mm -hmm. So we got our, our things back. Mm -hmm. And uh, Hugo Black from Alabama mm -hmm. got these four Alabama preachers, mm -hmm. their money My back. <laughs> <laughs> SCLC, how did you get organized? Well, these movements were going on in Birmingham, Montgomery, Mobile, Tallahassee. Nashville, Baton Rouge, all these movies going on. Most of them began with transportation, mm -hmm. buses, because transit, and I just completed 25 years on the board of the Transit Authority in Atlanta. In fact, I was chairman for three years during the Olympics. Mm -hmm. uh, because that's the closest, other than the police, that's the closest institution mm -hmm. to the people. Mm -hmm. People have to ride a bus. That's right. And so everybody's trying. The Montgomery bus boycott was effective, not only because of great leadership, but because everybody had a personal mm. thing mm -hmm. <laughs> for the bus. Touched everybody. That's right. Mm -hmm. if, it, if not you, your mama, mm -hmm. or your aunt, right. or your grandmother. So it was, it was a personal thing. So uh, that, that became the, uh, the issue. We were all fighting, but later, later voter registration and so forth. But uh, uh, Martin and Ralph, Fred and I, and at the beginning, C.G. Gamillion in Tuskegee, we used to try to meet in Montgomery at least once a month, hmm. if, if nothing else, to cry on each other's shoulder <laughs> about the terrible <clears throat> uh, pain of, 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 of oppression mm -hmm. and to plan strategies and so forth. And it was at those meetings that we talked about a Southwide meeting. Mm. Later, uh, by Russia and others also agreed there ought to be a Southwide meeting. So a Southwide meeting was called in Ebenezer in 1956, mm -hmm. toward the end of 1956. And while we were there, Ralph's house was bombed. Mm -hmm. And it broke up the meeting. But we met again in late January and early February in New Orleans mm -hmm. and organized SCLC. Oh, okay. It was so. called, we called ourselves at first um, a Southern Leadership Conference for on transportation and voting, mm. and it just kept changing the name to finally it evolved to mm. Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Right. After the SCLC is organized well, in 1960, 1957. Yeah, no, but 1960, yeah. SNCC is organized. Yes. Uh, what's the relationship? Well, SCLC people like Jim Lawson and, and others were involved in, in, in pulling SNCC together in, in, uh, in uh, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. So we had a good relationship. It, it began to, uh, the good relationship disintegrated into a fair relationship mm -hmm. because no matter what happened and where we went, Martin got the press, <laughs> the media, mm -hmm. and so the, the young guys, uh, Resented us, and they didn't call us SCLC. They called us Slick. 
<laughs> and he said these preachers could get all the media to their center and said, and then some of them used to sing a little song. We talked about love and nonviolation. Too much love, too much love. Nothing kill a nigga like too much love. <laughs> and that was that way of ridiculing the nonviolent yeah. But uh, uh, we had a, a good day. And, and as a matter of fact, when we met here in Birmingham at the AG Gaston Motel mm -hmm. uh, to plan a voting rights campaign, we had to get the vote. Mm -hmm. And the, the 64 bill had passed because of the Birmingham movement, public mm -hmm. accommodations bill, right. but we still couldn't vote. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, we talked, Martin met with the president, Johnson talked about it, he said, well, we can't have another bill so quick. Good God, let, the, let this bill kind of sink in. <laughs> <laughs> but then we came here and, and decided to go to Selma. Mm -hmm. SNCC was already in Selma. Right. And Prathia and some other people were in Selma. And, uh, but they weren't doing well. Mm -hmm. they, were, they were beating him to the ground. Right. But we decided to join Snick in Selma. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, once Martin went there, that, mm -hmm. that it became SCLC right. movement, really. Mm -hmm. And uh, the rest is history. Mm -hmm. um, we just celebrated uh, March 5th, the 35th anniversary right. of the uh, Selma Montgomery March. Right. And John Lewis, even though our staff was in charge of everything, John Lewis went down there mm -hmm. to join us, and he and Jose decided to march that mm -hmm. Sunday, even though Martin had told them not to march, mm -hmm. uh, but they did anyway, okay. and uh, the rest is history. Yes, yes. Now, from 1960 to 1963, there were a number of things taking place. The, of course, the organization of SNCC, the Freedom Rides would take place in 61 in Birmingham, in 62, there was a selective buying campaign, uh, Albany, Georgia took place in, in 62. Birmingham then would come along in 63. When did you leave Mobile? I left Mobile in 61 okay. and went to Nashville. All right. Uh, <laughs> I'll never forget uh, the mobile paper had a little headline, local agitator leaves town. <laughs> and uh, uh, one of the members of my church uh, came by that morning. She was upset about it. She said, I knew you were going to be upset, but I want you to drive me home. Mm -hmm. And she, I drove her home, and she carried me down the long hall, and we subdivided the house right to the back. There was a brand new washing machine. And she said, you see that little red thing? That's an agitator. Mm -hmm. Say, nothing's going to happen with these clothes to that agitator. So don't be upset. Yes, now yes. take me on back home. And a compliment. And be calm. That's right. She, she, she opened my eyes. Mm -hmm. She gave me a, a the good lesson in theology yeah. right, right there on her, in her front door. Yeah. Uh, but that was, that was uh, I left in 61, went to Nashville, and got involved in the Nashville movement. Mm -hmm. And was a part of the Nashville movement that desegregated public facilities in Nashville prior to the 64 Act. Okay. Uh, I remember we were sitting in in some of the Morrisons and Britlings and some of the other cafeterias and um, two things happened. One, uh, um, a fellow from FOR, mm -hmm. his name will come to me in a minute. Uh, joined us at a picket line in Britain. We've been picking down there all day, mm -hmm. and the uh, thugs had been rolling eyes, but they hadn't done anything. The minute, the minute the white guy got in the line, they knocked him down. Mm -hmm. They couldn't stand for a white fellow to be mm -hmm. in there. But, but uh, I remember sitting in the governor's office, Governor Clements, of Tennessee, because Morrison's wouldn't desegregate. They wouldn't open. Nobody would got arrested. No matter what happened, they would not desegregate. Mm -hmm. And I went to the governor and said, you should call the man who owns it. He was in Mobile. And uh, he did. He said, call him on the phone. He said, you, you are causing disruption of our community. We want it open. Mm -hmm. We've got everything else open, but you're Morrison's. Mm -hmm. And uh, he told the governor, be over his dead body. Mm -hmm. He wasn't going to do it. Interestingly enough, the act passed in the middle of the year in 64. 
he died a few months <laughs> after that. Over his dead yeah, body. Yeah, over his dead body. <laughs> yes. 63 Birmingham. How did you play into that? Well, I was in Nashville. I was administrative assistant to the bishop. And I couldn't spend as much time in Birmingham as I wanted to because I had these administrative responsibilities for North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, and Tennessee. Not Georgia, South North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, and Alabama. Mm -hmm. And I would come in and out to join them and go back. Uh, I, I wanted to be more involved. I just couldn't leave my responsibilities. Mm -hmm. I didn't have the freedom mm -hmm. of a pastor. I wasn't pastoring then. If mm -hmm. I had been pastoring as I was in Mobile, right. I'd have had much more freedom. As God would have it, I came to Birmingham to pastor in 64, mm -hmm. across the street at St. Paul right. United Methodist Church. Right. Now, when we play, when we, uh, uh, while I was in Nashville, the bombing took place mm -hmm. in Birmingham. 16th Street. Yes, Street. that was in uh, 63. Right. We were meeting in, but well, not before that, there was a bombing at A.G. Gasson right, Hotel. Right, in May. Yes. We were there that night mm -hmm. planning. A.D. King's was living, home was bombed the same night. I was living in Nashville. Mm -hmm. Martin and all of us were in room 30. Mm -hmm. That was the biggest room they had we were planning. Mm -hmm. And the next day, I, on a Sunday, I was to go to uh, uh, Athens, down from Nashville, to do a commencement. Mm -hmm. And I was leaving. I was going to catch the Pan America that night and go to uh, Nashville, bribe my family down. When we got ready to leave the room, Martin said, Joe, we're going to go on to Atlanta. I said, why don't you stay here? She said, close to Athens, here as you are Nashville, aren't you? I said, yes, why don't you stay here? The room paid for mm -hmm. and uh, don't go. And I said, okay, I guess I will. So they left and I stayed. I got ready to go to bed. And I said, I told my wife I was going to drive her down there with me. I'm going. I got up and just did make the pan hmm. and went to Nashville, got up and drove down there, and they bummed <laughs> room 30, and the big hole was right by the bed where I would have been sleeping. That's so right. God had something. He was, hmm. he was saving me. But then I moved to Birmingham mm -hmm. in 64, and uh, uh, Fred had gone to Cincinnati, Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. and I became president of Ministerial Alliance here and uh, all the day, uh, the uh, meetings about Selma and so forth took place in my church and in and in A.G. Gaston, and uh, uh, I became a real part of. Of course, the, the major thing had had already been consummated, but mm -hmm. there I became a part of the Birmingham movement. We had some demonstrations against. Uh, Liberty supermarket. Mm -hmm. We had them beaten. The boycott was 99.9 tenths percent effective. Mm -hmm. But Fred came down that night. We had a mass beating out at Davis Church, St. Paul AME. Mm -hmm. And Fred decided we wanted to march that night. And I tried to get to him. I couldn't before he announced it, but when I got there, he'd already announced it. We were going on to the street. Well, it was too late then. Mm -hmm. And I said, I said, Fred, this is totally unnecessary. We take it too big a risk. Mm -hmm. night, but we were halfway down that end. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, that's the night when the fella shook the car and the fella got shot, mm -hmm. sued us, and we cost us $90,000. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but that was uh, Birmingham. Uh, I left Birmingham in 68 mm -hmm. and went to Atlanta. Mm -hmm. uh, I was uh, vice president of SCLC then from our organizing up until 67. Right. And at the convention in Atlanta, Martin asked me if I'd serve as chairman of the board. We didn't have a chairman of the board. Martin was both. Mm -hmm. And they asked me if I would be chairman of the board, and I agreed to do that so I could preside at the meetings and take some of the weight off of his shoulders, and I did that. And then, uh, But he always wanted me to come to Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, no, I, my place is here. And the Birmingham News had just had an editorial about uh, blacks ought to be elected to public office and 
There are a lot of blacks who are qualified, and they're missing a bunch of names, and mine was one of them. I said, well, maybe it's time for me to leave. <laughs> they burn their news. And <laughs> decided yeah. I'm qualified with it. The job but, is done. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 well, or, or at least I'm doing something wrong that they, that they please with me. But, but uh, uh, I went on uh, to Atlanta, and I was chairman of the board then, and uh, Martin had tried to get me to come to Atlanta from the early 60s on up to run SCLC, and I didn't go. And he died in April. Mm -hmm. I went in June. Mm -hmm. It was ironic that uh, he didn't live to see me come to mm -hmm. Atlanta. But even then, I didn't have any intention of running SCLC. Mm -hmm. Ralph was president. He wanted me to come down to the office, so I had an office, and I work with the fiscal responsibilities. He ran the, the programmatic responsibilities. And then, of course, in 77, mm -hmm. Ralph decided to run for Congress mm -hmm. and resigned in uh, February. Mm -hmm. The board elected the acting president mm -hmm. and chairman. I was already chairman of the board. So I stayed there. We went and met with Carter after he got elected and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, when Hogg then Ralph ran for Congress and lost. But by the time the convention came, the uh, group had decided that I should stay as president. And uh, Ralph, we had several private discussions, uh, and we persuaded Ralph if he would accept President Emeritus. Mm -hmm. And I, I said, you have an office down and Walter Fontenot would be chairman of the board. Ralph wanted to be chairman of the board if he couldn't be president, mm -hmm. but we had already talked to Walter. Mm -hmm. And so Ralph took President Emeritus. And uh, that's what happened. Jose mm -hmm. uh, ran against me mm -hmm. for president, but he was soundly defeated. <laughs> <laughs> and we are good friends. Yeah. But uh, that's how I became president. I had no intention mm -hmm. of becoming president because uh, it was more convenient. Uh, a Baptist pastor could be president with much more facility because he was rooted in the community, stayed longer, right. wasn't accountable to, to yeah, uh, right. a bureaucracy and right. administrative structure that sometimes was white as well as black. Mm -hmm. But I took it and yeah. held it longer than Martin and Ralph together. Mm -hmm. I mean, 21 years almost, mm -hmm. from, from February of 77 to right. January of 98. And uh, uh, had some problem with the, uh, with the hierarchy mm -hmm. of my church, but made it through. As a matter of fact, it was very interesting. Bishop Cannon, Bishop William Cannon, white, Dean of Candler School of Theology at Emory was my bishop. Mm -hmm. And before he was elected bishop, he was the official apologist for segregation in the church. Whenever somebody questioned the theology or doctrine, or the efficacy of, of segregation in the Christian community, mm -hmm. uh, they would call on Cannon to give a biblical, theological, doctrinal defense. And he became bishop, and he was the bishop when I was about to be elected. I decided I would go to him and tell him mm -hmm. what was about to happen. Uh, and he said, no, 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 you can't leave Central. I said, wait a minute, I won't leave Central. I said, remember Martin Pastor Ebenezer? Mm -hmm. I said, I don't have to leave Central. I will just be the spokesman. I lied a little bit. <laughs> I said, I'll just be the spokesman. Staff will do most of the work and so forth. He said, oh, well, that's different. Yes, I, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. He said, as a Methodist preacher, you would be the linear successor to Martin Luther King. That bring, brings great honor to the church. And wrote an editorial in the, in the church paper, the Christian Advocate, mm -hmm. saying what, he just, what I just related to right. you. was a very, very startling and almost miraculous uh, mm -hmm. thing that happened there. And I... And he wished me well, and I stayed there 21 years. Well, what did he did he change any after he saw how active you were? Or? No, it was too late then. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> too late then. No, he uh, he enjoyed. He we talked. He, he every position that I took, public position, was in harmony with the position of the church, mm -hmm. and that was the 
power of our movement. Some called us communists, but that was a compliment to communism that they didn't deserve. Mm -hmm. our, 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 our principles, our methodology, our, our protests, our philosophy uh, were Christian, mm -hmm. democratic. Mm -hmm. And to give communism credit was a was a, was blasphemy. Right. So that the, so that the, the, the church, a sincere churchman, could not challenge our position. We stood on the grounds that God had made of one blood. Mm -hmm. And that God did not believe in oppression of his people and that God was identified all through the Old Testament on the side of the oppressed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that the Moses and the Amos and, and Joshua and, and others throughout history were, were, were Christian statesmen mm -hmm. and prophets. Mm -hmm. And that we were in that endless line of splendor. Yes. And the church couldn't argue with that. They said the same thing about the labor movement as well, that it was communist inspired. How did the labor movement and the civil rights movement interact? One of the reasons I was so honored to get the Walter Ruther Award last uh, December in Detroit from Wayne University in UAW was that Walter Ruther was probably the most prophetic labor leader uh, and the most activist in terms of civil rights that we've ever had in this country. And, and, and he marched with us. Uh, I have a picture at home uh, marching with us in, in, in uh, Charleston in, in 69. Uh, when we were fighting for the hospital workers, mm -hmm. Ruther was, and, and, and he and Martin were friends. And, and the, the, the liberal, progressive element of the labor movement, particularly CIO, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, joined with us in many instances mm -hmm. uh, because they recognized that we were fighting for human rights, workers' rights, poor people's rights, and that was in sync with what labor stood for. Now there were conservative right. labor folks like sure. everything else yeah. who didn't take that position, yeah. but uh, we had a good co coalescence mm -hmm. with the labor movement, and until this day, uh, when I retired, there were Bill Lucy, who heads the Black Coalition of Trade Union, was on my board, Joe Davis, mm -hmm. UAW Civil Rights Leader on my board, uh, Cleola, uh, Brown with the now Unite was on our board. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a good, good relationship. Mm -hmm. And uh, when Walter Ruther passed, uh, we became a good relationship with everybody who succeeded him in, in UAW. Mm -hmm. So it's been a good, uh, uh, and not that we haven't had problems with labor. Mm -hmm. And I, you have to understand there were times when I took positions uh, against the labor movement, uh, and I still do for that matter, mm -hmm. but because I think there are pockets where they are still uh, insensitive and, and discriminate. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, John Sweeney uh, elected to succeed, um, mm -hmm. uh, never, well, we get his name later, yeah. uh, 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 is much more sensitive than his predecessor. Mm -hmm. So it's okay. gotten better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the book that, um, the controversy in the book that um, Reverend Abernathy wrote, and that was during the time that you were in the forefront, how did that play? Sad. It was a very sad chapter in the history of the movement. Uh, Ralph was probably closer to Martin than any of us. They were in Montgomery right. together. Uh, important role in Martin's leadership capacity. Uh, 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 Alabama State this past year just established a civil rights series in, in Ralph's honor. I gave the first lecture mm -hmm. uh, and I commended them for taking that step. Uh, Ralph was not only an advocate for civil rights and justice. He also was an advocate for Martin's leadership. Mm -hmm. He had more seniority in Montgomery than Martin did. Mm -hmm. so he could stand up to some of the old timers mm 
mm-hmm. when Martin couldn't. Mm-hmm. And it's always good to have somebody else fight your battles, sure. uh, come to your defense, because who has that said that he who is his own lawyer has a fool for a client? <laughs> <laughs> but but Ralph, Ralph played a very important role. Mm-hmm. And Ralph worked hard as, as president. The book, the book is, remains enigmatic. It remains a mystery. Mm. There are those who think that the, Ralph had had a very serious operation, you know, right. on his brain. Mm-hmm. Doctor uh, from Montgomery, uh, whose father was president of Montgomery for a long time, whose brother's an attorney here in Montgomery now, yeah. did the surgery and it was very delicate, very serious surgery. There are those who think that maybe Ralph had moments when he mm-hmm. didn't recall things too clearly. There are others who think that the publisher who provided a writer to work with Ralph uh, influenced Ralph to include something sensational to uh, mm-hmm. be a catalyst for sales mm-hmm. of right. the book. Uh, there are theories that other members of Ralph's uh, immediate family may have contributed mm-hmm. something. We don't know, mm-hmm. except we do know that Bernard Lee was there, who has now passed himself all the time, and Bernard vigorously denied Bernard, uh, Ralph's recollection of the last evening. Mm. Uh, but it was sad because it, it put in peril uh, the record that Ralph had made. All his achievements, all his contributions were imperiled by this dangerous voyage into mm. scandalizing his friend's name. Mm-hmm. Speaking of that, you were very much involved when the FBI, or J. Edgar Hoover, sent this material to King. Could yeah. you, would you uh, relate that? I was pastoring here then, mm-hmm. and at St. Paul, and we're living out on, gee, I forgot the name of the street, the, the freeway has gone right through where our house was out there, I believe on 10th Street, I forgot. But anyway, uh, Martin called me. And uh, one evening he said, you, can you get over here in the morning? I said, I don't know, I got here. I don't care what you got. You got to get over here to board it. Mm-hmm. So we went over there. Uh, and uh, well, the next day, and we had to meet Ralph, Andy, myself, Martin. I don't remember who else. But he told us about the tape. We played the tape. Coretta had already heard it. And uh, the tape was not clear. Uh, we think two things. Either the, the technology that they used to record the conversation at the Willard Hotel uh, was not sufficient to get a clear uh, a picture, a clear recording, clear sound. Mm-hmm. Or we think they may have deliberately muffled parts of it because some of it we don't believe were our voices. Mm-hmm. I was in the room. Mm-hmm. And some of the, the, the sound didn't, sound like they may have had somebody impersonating some of us to say some nasty things because nobody was there recalled anybody saying that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, but at any rate, um, the note that came with it said that Martin should, should take his own life mm-hmm. or they were going to expose this tape and we all decided well, number one we know you're not going to take your own life mm-hmm. number two it's fabrication uh that may have been part of the conversation was authentic whenever you get that many preachers in a room mm-hmm. they're going to tell lies <laughs> and, and, and about that sermon and all that mm-hmm. sort of stuff but uh uh that was what that was and mm-hmm. and uh, we released it that was our message back to Mm. The FBI, a fellow named Sullivan, was uh, an important figure for the FBI in that. And uh, we believe that it was taped by and distributed by the FBI. Mm. Um, 
Coretta didn't believe it, and uh, none of us really were. I came back and told my wife what it was said. It, 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 it portrayed an orgy. Mm. And later on, uh, a black writer, uh, Cowan, mm. uh, uh, also used that book to say some nasty things about Martin and Ralph. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was 90% fabrication. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that we were saints. I'm not saying yeah. Martin was a saint. The only one I know who's been called a saint was John, mm -hmm. John Lewis. Mm -hmm. I think Time Magazine called him a saint. Yeah. But uh, I don't, I don't, I'm no saint. Martin yeah. was no saint. But neither was, uh, was Martin mm -hmm. as promiscuous as yeah. as Ralph's book and other charges would have indicated. That, that simply isn't true. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a question about uh, the women in the movement, the wives of the leaders of the movement. Um, I know that there probably were times when you had to go someplace. Your wife may say, well, you know, how, how did you handle that relationship, keep that relationship together and, 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 and be successful? I guess my wife's most difficult time was in Mobile when the children were small mm -hmm. and I had to go away. She had to stay there through the telephone calls mm. uh, round the clock right. and the threats of bombing. Let me tell you something else. When I first moved to Mobile in 1952, uh, the party was next to the church, and there was a restaurant right across the street called Big Mama's. <laughs> and Big Mama's was Big Mama's. Mm -hmm. And Big Mama had a shoebox, and it played all night long. <laughs> and we slept upstairs, and the sound came right out of Big Mama's, right across the street, up into our bedrooms. And we had a tough time. We came down from Alexander City. Mm -hmm where we live in a quiet <laughs> residential community. There wasn't a jukebox within a mile, two miles of, of our house. And that, that contrast uh, required a very uh, uh, difficult adjustment. Mm -hmm. And uh, I used to go and talk with Big Mama and say, is there any way we could tone down the thing a little bit? And she did, mm -hmm. but at two o'clock in the morning with no other competing sounds, mm -hmm. even a tuned down you box, the yeah, sound travels, you know, it travels. And, uh, but then when things broke, and there was a green truck and a red truck that the Klan traveled around in, and the word was out, they were going to bomb my house. And uh, uh, they never did. Mm. And the reason they never did was that they never could find a time when somebody wasn't hanging around Big Mama's <laughs> <laughs> and could see. You were protected the by the truck bus. Well, let me tell you, what at first was an intrusive noise became a comforting lullaby. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that was very interesting. Uh, 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 the Klan was uh, active in Mobile, mm -hmm, no mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. So that was, uh, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, this goes without saying, a, a, a real strength where your wife was concerned to keep the family together. They were strong women. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, all of us had strong wives. Uh, I hated to leave them alone, but Men of the church would take turns here in Birmingham, mm -hmm. particularly following the uh, march, mm -hmm. the 65 march, mm -hmm. when Martin named me to carry the demands of the march to Wallace. Mm -hmm. And he named me at the, at the end of his speech, the chair of the group, E.G. Gaston, Billingsley, President Tuskegee, so forth. Mm -hmm. and then when we, the troopers were guarding the steps of the Capitol. Was the, 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 the National Guard had been federalized. There was a general there in charge. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I went, we would take the demands up to the door of the Capitol. And I went to the general 
And I said, what, what, what's going to happen here? We're supposed to take. He said, I've cleared it. I've talked with them. They're going to let you come up and bring them to the governor. Mm -hmm. So I carried my folks on up the step. But when we got to the top of the step, the troopers closed in mm -hmm. and would not let us pass. Formed a blue sea. Mm -hmm. Moses had the red sea. <laughs> Joseph Lyre had the blue sea. Blue sea. So I looked back at the general, as if to say, I thought you said, and the general saw what was happening. And he stepped off the back of his truck where he was watching everything and yelled some commands, which I didn't understand, but the National Guard did. Mm -hmm. And they trump, trump, trump over and confronted the troopers and said, Hup! and they swung those bayonets around like that. And the blue sea, like the red sea, <laughs> opened up. <laughs> and we marched through on dry steps mm -hmm. and carried the uh, petition to the door of the Capitol. Mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. Governor's secretary came. We want to see the governor. Well, the governor says, give me the demand. So, oh, no. Mm -hmm. We don't march 50 miles mm -hmm. from seven of the government to give the demand to a secretary. Mm -hmm. And if the governor won't receive us, we will not submit the demand. So we didn't get to meet that day. Hmm. And we came on back home. And uh, that's when the threats were terrible here in Birmingham with me hmm. because I had chaired the committee. Right. The governor had refused to see me. The Klan had killed by all the Uso that hmm. night. Hmm. And so the officers of the church uh, would, took turns uh, watching the church yeah. and the parsonage mm -hmm. because we didn't want to have to get in there on Sunday. Mm -hmm. and have to evacuate. Right. So we watched the church around the clock mm -hmm. so that they know that we was clear. And uh, as, you, as you know, um, um, they didn't bum the house, they didn't mm -hmm. bum us, mm -hmm. and we did, but the wives were, were, were wonderful. Later we did meet with the governor. Mm -hmm. Bishop Gooden, Kenneth Gooden. Mm -hmm. United Methodist Bishop here in Alabama mm -hmm. uh, persuaded Wallace, who was a Methodist, mm -hmm. to meet with us. Mm -hmm. So then the governor's secretary called me and said, the governor has said he will meet with a part of the group. I said, oh? So out of curiosity, I asked him what part. Mm -hmm. He said, meet with A.G. Gaston, we'll meet with President of Tuskegee, we'll meet with Attorney so-and-so, Fred Gray who was from down at Wallace's home, so forth and so on. I said, well, I'll tell you what. As far as I'm concerned, the governor cannot tell us who represents us. Mm -hmm. But I would poll the group and get back to you. Mm -hmm. So I did. I polled the group to a, to a man. They said, no, mm -hmm. either we all go mm -hmm. or none of us should go. So I gleefully <laughs> called the governor's office and said to Word is that it's all or nothing at all. Mm -hmm. He said, well, I'll call you back. <laughs> and so he called me back, I guess, I don't know whether next day or later that day. But anyway, he said, the governor, okay, mm -hmm. he'll meet with you. Mm -hmm. And so we had a 90-minute meeting mm -hmm. with the governor, uh, during which time I challenged him as a Methodist pastor to a Methodist layman mm -hmm. that God was going to hold him accountable. Uh, for what he was doing. Well, I don't, I don't believe in vows. He asked Governor, but you have a forum from which you can speak that the thugs don't have. Mm -hmm. And they want to identify with you. And so while you rave and rant about your interposition and so forth, they shoot Valerie Utso. Mm -hmm. They smash the skull of Jonathan Reeve and, and uh, Jonathan Daniels and so forth. Mm -hmm. James Reeve. And that was a historic meeting with the governor. Mm -hmm. He called me to his bedside um, when I was at Montgomery, not long before he died, to pray for him. Mm -hmm. We had established a relationship that, in fact, he came to me in 95 when we conducted the 30th anniversary uh, reenactment of 7 March. He came to meet me. Mm -hmm. And the march was out at St. Jude and apologized for Mm -hmm. on the front page of almost every paper in the country. Yeah. Apologize for his deeds in 65. Mm. In 95 he did. In 95. Well, he was, 
He was sick. In a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. Could hardly talk about a whisper. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, in 85, the rascal was back in the, in the governor's house mm -hmm. on the 20th anniversary. Well, they had that reenactment. And we went by to see him. He was in his office, but he was in pain. Mm -hmm. And we prayed with him there. Mm -hmm. And he gave us kind of an apology. Mm -hmm. But not like the one he gave in 95, 95 when he right was in that wheelchair, came out. Hmm. When, when, when we got word, we were coming into Montgomery the night before, we got word that Wallace wanted to meet us. Some of my people didn't want it to happen. Hmm. No. And I decided that as he stood in the schoolhouse door, hindering education for young people, I wasn't going to stand hmm. in the door of his repentance. Hmm. Because he had nothing to gain right. from uh, from coming out there. Right. No way he could gain politically. Mm -hmm. He was in a wheelchair. Yeah. Hard to talk about a whisper. Mm -hmm. And I guess this was his means of making sure he had let God know mm -hmm. and the public know that he that, had yeah. repented. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't about to. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I used it. I wrote an article for the New York Times. And I said that was a message Wallace was sending to the demagogues of the day, that you see where the roads of hate mm. lead, mm. and they have a chance to repent mm. now, as Wallace did much later. Mm. Reverend Larry, you have had a tremendous career in life, um, but you obviously are not finished. What's next? <laughs> <laughs> I'm retired. <laughs> what do you mean? I've been retired two years now. Uh, uh, nobody believes me. A uh, group in uh, Atlanta, in Georgia, came to me and asked me if I would convene a coalition of representatives of various groups called the People's Agenda, which I did. Uh, they seem to think I could be successful in pulling all the leadership together. Mm -hmm. Uh, because I guess I had the Black Leadership Forum nationally, which includes all the groups. Mm -hmm. I've been trying to retire from that. Mm -hmm. But uh, we, we, we are working to improve the quality of governance in Georgia. Mm -hmm. Then the farmers came to me, Chestnut and the black mm -hmm. farmers around mm -hmm. the country, and said, mm -hmm. will you help us with this suit we've got? So I pulled part of the civil rights community and religious community together to support the farmers. Mm -hmm. And the judge even let me speak to his court uh, on a hearing they had, uh, which I appreciated very much. I mm -hmm. had been in court, but never let me uh, address <laughs> the court. But uh, we won the suit. Mm -hmm. Farmers won the suit. It's still a battle because I think they're rejecting too many applications, so we still got to fight. But mm -hmm. the victory was marvelous. Mm -hmm. It is the closest thing. It's the only thing, for that matter, that's happened to black folks that even smell like reparations. Mm. Mm. We think when the settlements are over and completed, that somewhere between one and two billion dollars would have gone from the Department of Agriculture mm. into the hands of black farmers mm. and their heirs mm. uh, in this country. Mm -hmm. So that got me out of retirement. Then, the next thing I knew, a group of automobile dealers, former automobile dealers, I won't call the name of the automobile, but they were bankrupt. They had been abused and neglected by the, the manufacturer. They didn't keep the promises they made to give them this and give them that and help them. Mm -hmm. And some of them had gone bankrupt, all of them had gone bankrupt. Mm -hmm. One fellow down in Tuskegee had lost his home, his wife's home, another one in North Carolina, his mother, his wife's mother's property, and they came and asked me if I would help them. And I said, uh, only on one condition, that you let me give the leadership, let me decide if and when we go public, mm -hmm. if we can work it out in negotiation across the table, let's do it that way. They said, whatever you, we have nothing to lose and everything to gain. Mm -hmm. So we worked, about seven or eight of them, and I went to the head of General Motors. Mm -hmm. Gosh, darn it. Can we take that out? <laughs> I didn't mean to call the court, but, but we went to the head of the It's company. noted. I mean, you know, that's, that's no secret. That, that's uh, pretty well known. Is it? it is. Well, we that went General to the head. Motors head. 
And they, well, it's not just General Motors. Yeah. Ford has done the same thing, all mm -hmm. of them. But yeah, all of them. I give General Motors credit mm -hmm. that when I went to the leadership and explained what was going on, they worked with me. Mm -hmm. And for a year and a half, we've been fighting that battle, not a single press conference, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but we've gotten settlements mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. six or seven former dealers, mm -hmm. two in Alabama, North Carolina, mm -hmm. who otherwise would have been left penniless. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm very proud of that. It was a hard fight, but I'm like Joe Lewis, I'm glad I win. <laughs> so that day kept me pretty busy. Then the black promoters came. Mm -hmm. And they are saying, will you help us? Did you know that no white artist has ever given a concert promoted by a black promoter? No mm -hmm. major white artist. And when the black artists get major, mm -hmm. the booking agency take them away from the black promoters. Mm -hmm. So we've been fighting that battle. Mm -hmm. And we've got a lawsuit filed now against the creative artists and William Morris agency, the big book and talent agencies in California mm -hmm. that control everything. Mm -hmm. And so I've been, plus I'm trying to write mm -hmm. a book and uh, I'd like a little more time <laughs> if you could help me. <laughs> I'd appreciate it. But I guess uh, you're right. I've had a tremendously enriching career. And I planned to the title of my book, but Maya beat me to it, is I wouldn't take nothing from a journey. Mm. And uh, I wouldn't, so I don't know what I'm gonna call my book, but mm -hmm. the Lord has blessed me so much. He let me live uh, long enough to see some things come to pass that, mm -hmm. that we would never have believed. Mm -hmm would come to pass. In March, March 5th last month, we saw the President of the United States mm. come to Selma, Alabama. That's right. Mm. Uh, in 1965, the President had to send troops to protect us. In 2000, he came to direct us. Yes. <laughs> he good. led the march. In 65, the government of Alabama sent troopers to beat us. In 2000, he came to greet us mm. and the troopers to salute us mm. as we crossed that bridge. I never dreamed, you know, I, I, I'm hoping that Martin, I'm pretty sure Martin saw that. Mm -hmm. If he didn't, I certainly will tell him about it when I <laughs> see him. That was a marvelous thing and should demonstrate to those who are tending to sink into pits of lethargy about voting, the power of the ballot. Bill Clinton would never have come down. Huh? He wouldn't even been president. Right. Nor would have Jimmy Carter mm -hmm. without the ballot right. that it was made possible by that Selma to Montgomery voting rights campaign. I never dreamed we'd see that. And I, I can name so many uh, things that have come to pass. Uh, the president called my name a couple of times mm -hmm. in the speech. I spoke to the group as I did uh, earlier, but. Uh, this little old small town Texter Mill colored boy mm -hmm. from the north <laughs> of Alabama uh, has come a long, long way from that punch in the belly mm -hmm. uh, on, until this day, and I'm grateful. I don't care what Maya called her book. <laughs> I wouldn't take nothing for my journey. I wouldn't take nothing for it. God has blessed me. And, and maybe it didn't completely over. Maybe, you know, God got some use for me. I hope mm -hmm. he lets me write this book. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm 78 mm -hmm. and uh, uh, still breathing well enough to get a good night's rest. Blessing, and blessing, and I'm, I'm very grateful. But yes. the movement has been a tremendous spiritual experience. Mm -hmm. uh, I almost didn't make it. Almost died in 79. 24 miles from where I was born, in Decatur, Alabama, mm. when the Klan shot four young people in the head when I was leading a march on behalf of Tommy Lee Hines, a young retarded man who accused of rape who couldn't even ride a bicycle. Mm. And they said he drove a car mm. in the process of the rape. We saved his life. Mm. And uh, God spared me uh, out of that shooting by heard the bullets 
<laughs> as close as, mm. too close. Mm. Mm. Uh, but God spared me, and I, I thank God for the richness of my experience. Um, I wouldn't take nothing. So I just want to say, you know, that I really, not just myself, but everyone, just really appreciate you, not just as a civil rights leader, because you are obviously that, you are a giant among giants, but your person okay. is what is so important. You know, you have, you, you don't meet strangers and you, uh, you're genuine. Uh, and, you know, we've talked about it. We love you for that. Well, thank you. I love people. Mm -hmm. uh, my daughter works over at the University of Alabama and yes. we were over there today and, and uh, when I drove up and she told the people where she was going, the whole place came out with her, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, much to my disgret, regret, because I was hungry. I was trying to get the, <laughs> what is it, jab <laughs> yeah. But But I, I enjoyed meeting them, I enjoy, I love people, and, mm -hmm. and uh, my work has been, I, I never separated my ministry, never fragmented it. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was a holistic ministry. I never, I never separated my pastoral duties. Mm -hmm. Not only included uh, uh, ministering to my flock, but trying to spread the bomb mm -hmm. in Gilead mm -hmm. to all the world. Mm -hmm. And and I enjoyed doing that. And and uh, I preach. It's a preaching for me, you know. I, yeah. When I'm marching, I'm preaching. I, yes. mm -hmm. And. Uh, I thank God he's, he's empowered me to, to do it for a long, long time. We certainly appreciate you, uh, Reverend Dr. Lowry. Uh, and Joseph or Joe. As <laughs> long as you call me. I don't care what you call me. Just don't call, just call you call later me. for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. You're quite welcome. You're quite welcome.